everybody, and uh, welcome back to the Fenced In podcast. You are with me, Ben Peggs, and with Chris Mollard. We are two GB foilists and actually coach and student. Um, as a lot of you know, we started the podcast in uh, lockdown, um, and slowly we are coming out of that, and we've been bringing you guests um, as and where we can. This is episode 20, and we are very, very, very pleased and privileged to introduce uh, the one and only Mr. Richard Cruz. Um, I'm going to go through a nice little introduction for him, see if you can keep up. So we've got Richard is former world number one, four-time Olympian, of those Olympic Games, he's made the quarter and the semi-finals. We reckon, or Richard reckons, that he's attended over 170 World Cup and Grand Prix events, winning a total of nine of those events, and even more impressively, only having gone out six times on the first day from those ones. Um, he's World Championship silver medalist and seven times Euro- European Championship medalist, and actually is a further three medals from the European champs at junior level. So what an introduction. Chris, what do you make of that? Mind blowing. <laughs> you've done all you've done all right, Richard. Firstly, how are you doing? And also, how does it feel to to hear that read out? Yeah, I'm very well, thanks. I'm just uh, excuse the slurping. I'm having a little uh, cup of oolong, a little afternoon cup of oolong tea. Yeah, it, it, looking back, it's quite impressive. Of course, at the time, at the time, you don't really stop to reflect so much. You just want the next thing, the next thing. You, you're sort of never happy as an athlete. You're so greedy. You always want something more. But now it's all over and I've retired. Looking back, it's, uh, yeah, what a great journey. Great adventure. Doha was your was your final swan song and actually you are now a retired man. What does it feel like to actually say, wow, you know, after all the years in the game that you've been in, you are now retired. How does that feel? Yeah, it feels strange because I've been doing fencing, been training since 1994. And, you know, I've been training a long time, as you will testify, because we've trained together for, what is it? We probably about 15 years Pegsy what do you think I think so you said we were six we started training together 2006 I remember your dad brought you into the the factory that's it and, <laughs> and yeah and we trained uh, ever since then didn't we, we and neither of us really had uh, you know years off uh, no, so we trained all the way through yeah it feels strange now it's all over um, but you know there are some realities of being a professional sportsman and one of them is the longevity isn't quite as long as other other sports, you know. So when you're in your late 30s, well, if you get to the late 30s and you're still competing, you've probably done quite well. So we knew it couldn't last forever. One of the biggest achievements for you has not only been your career results, but keeping yourself um, in good shape for, for, for all for all those those years. And it's crazy you say started in 94. That would have made me nine years old. So, uh, yeah, that, that's, that is, that's young for me. So you just mentioned being in your late 30s. It's older than a lot of athletes, I suppose, probably of around your period were, were carrying on until. Like, what do you what do you think's made the difference? What's made you go on? Ben, ben, can I just say you weren't nine years old in 1994. I think you've done the, the maths right. <laughs> no, no, sorry, I said four years old. If I said nine, that's my apologies. I, <laughs> in 1994, I was four years old, yes. Um, so if I said nine... <laughs> I, but, I, well, before we go any further, can I just tell the audience, we're in a slightly awkward position here because I have I agreed a long time ago, uh, ago to do your podcast and yeah. I'm a man of my word, so here I am. But after I retired, British Fencing wanted to you know, do a, an interview. So a few days ago, I've just done an interview uh, with Johnny Davis. It took about two hours. It was actually very professionally done. You know, you, you saw me in, uh, in Hendon. I brought in uh, track suits, medals, uh, press cuttings. And uh, even had a little clacker board, you know, so, you, you know, you've got somewhere when you've got a clacker board. We discussed my career and all the milestones. So for this interview, we, we can't really, you know, address those things because we've got a whole interview coming out. Yeah. So I want, they're going to put something in the sword, but there's too much to cover to put it, you know, page after page. So they're going to put a little link in the sword and then that will take you to the interview. They're going to edit it down from two hours to probably like 45 minutes. And um, so we covered all the milestones. but. We can still have a good chat here just about things on the, you know, sort of on the periphery of my career. Um, you know, we've got a few, few good topics to talk about. What do you yeah. associate to the longevity of your career at the highest level? Is there any one particular thing? Is it? Yeah, uh, well, look, th- there's certainly luck involved as, as well. You know, some people do get some, some pretty bad injuries. You know, I was quite lucky throughout my career. But then I remember saying to one uh, physio, they asked me, when were you last injured? And I said, oh, you know, two, three years ago. I'm lucky. And he said, no, it's not luck. You make your own luck. So, of course, you've got the freak injuries. But, you know, as Ben would uh, 
would testify to. You know, we spend so much time warming up, warming down, just trying to keep the body in, uh, in good shape. We almost spend more time warming down and warming up. If you add that time up, we spend more time doing that than actually fencing. Yeah. So you really do have to look after your body as an athlete. And if you're very professional, then you should get the longevity. But of course, nothing's guaranteed. You know, you could, uh, you could develop a chronic injury that you just can't resolve. And I've seen that happen in, in a lot of fences, as I'm sure Ben has as well. And, you know, we lost a lot of talent uh, over the years that way. What's quite interesting as well is you mentioned warming up and warming down and, you know, training consistency. So that, for me, goes into motivation. And so one of my questions is, is whether or not motivation has, uh, has been all about habit for you or whether, um, you know, mo- motivation comes from something else. Like, where, like what's, your, what's your drive? Does drive feed habit? Does habit feed drive? Or is it... I- I think um, routine is a good trick. If you can get into a routine, it's a great way of getting a colossal amount of work done without really thinking too much about it. Once you're in the routine, then the years start to fly by. And uh, yeah, you don't really have to think about it. You just end up, you're in the routine. You turn up on time every time you do your warm up, you do your fencing, you do your cool down and you don't really think about it. But then, you know, when you look back, you've really put in the mileage, which is what you have to do in Olympic sports. There's no way around it. You have to put in the mileage, not just in fencing, you know, in other sports, you hear stories of the swimmers, these kids getting up in the morning, swimming before school, going to school, swimming after school. You just have to get that, uh, that, that time in. A long time, obviously, as you say, you know, doing the warming up, cooling down and getting into that rhythm and that routine. Um, and, you know, I, I certainly, you know, can attest the fact that consistency is, is, is key in your training to kind of track any form of, of progression, but obviously for yourself and qualified for, for Olympic Games, you know, there's been a huge amount of consistency. Talking about the kind of Olympic Games and, and, and everything that embodies that, um, obviously, they've been a huge part of your career. What, what's your kind of take on, on Tokyo at the moment and what's happening with COVID? Um, some of the, you know, like kind of selections that go on for, for the Olympic Games. What's your kind of whole take about what this summer will bring in terms of Tokyo 2021? Yeah, it's going to be interesting, isn't it? Because it's very hard to make any kind of prediction now as to who's in good form because we've literally had a year out. Then we've had one competition. You know, you can't make a, a prediction based on just one competition. You know, Ficoni lost his first match, you, you know, but he could still go on to win. But then no one knows what form he's in. It's, it's absolutely uncharted territory. COVID has broken sport. I mean, it's broken everything, but not least sport. And it's... Uh, you know, I think the FIE were damned if they did and damned if they didn't. If they did the selection again, they'd be criticised for it. If they keep the old selection, then you, you're literally using results from, what, May 2019 for a championship in the summer of 2021. Um, you know, there's no right or wrong answer. So, um, yeah, I mean, is the Olympics going to even happen? I think it is, isn't it? Everyone's saying it's going to happen. I think it's one of those situations where, you know, it, it's they've now said that, you know, there's no foreign uh, spectators are allowed. Um, things like that. There seems to be, you know, having read a few snippets that um, there's another wave of coronavirus going through kind of Japan at the moment. Um, I know a lot of the locals don't seem particularly happy about it. It seems like quite a turbulent time. They were only saying recently that, you know, the the uh, the idea that the athletes come in, they say quarantine, they're getting tested every day, they can only eat in a certain place, um, they can't travel on public transport. I mean, Richard, you know what an Olympic experience feels like and, and you know, having been very lucky to travel out with you guys to, to, to Rio and also us having done the European Games together, we know what that kind of experience of a traditional Olympic Games would be. What do you think it's going to be like for the athletes now? It wouldn't be what you consider a conventional experience. I think this is probably a good one to miss if you're going to miss one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, I feel a little bit sorry for the, the athletes that have qualified because, yeah, they won't get the full Olympic experience. I uh, sat in on a Zoom meeting a few months ago with Mark England, who's the chef of the mission of Team GB, and he said, I think athletes are allowed into the village maybe three or four days before their event. And then 48 hours after their event, they have to leave the village. So, yeah, no public transport. That means no after parties. That means, you know, as you said, no foreign spectators. Um, yeah. One of my students had tickets booked to go to, to the Olympics. Now he's got a refund. So, yeah, the whole experience is going to be very different, isn't it? It's going to be pretty much like a world championships. You go in, do your event and then, and then leave. So, yeah, it is a bit. It's a bit sad for the people, especially the people that have qualified for the first time. They won't get that proper Olympic experience. But then I suppose they're lucky that they're getting a Games at all. You know, in this current climate of COVID, who knows? Uh, it wasn't really certain whether the Olympics would happen at all. And how did you find, did you find your experience changed for each Olympics? Did you go to more parties or fewer parties? <laughs> One after the other. It's really inspirational to have seen, 
you know, to be actually be speaking to somebody that's been to so many, let alone been to one. And, um, you know, I'm sure there's a huge amount that you learned from it. And, you know, we've spoken before with, I think it was Johnny Davis, but also other people, I don't remember who exactly, but about kind of multi, you know, multi-event championships, mm. you know, multi-sport. Yeah, I, I love uh, Olympic sport. I'm a real Olympic buff. So in each of the four, I went to as many sports as I could go to. I think literally every day after my event, I was down in the BOA headquarters and then you go there in the morning, they give tickets, um, you know, they, they get a certain amount of allocated tickets available and then you just, you can apply for something, but then you just, you don't always get it. You just take what they've got. And uh, yeah, literally every day I was in a sport and then you get invited to the after parties. It's funny. It's the only time you can go out clubbing in a tracksuit and the bouncer won't kick you out. The bouncer will open the rope, bring you to the front because, you know, just think at that moment in time, you're, you're the talk of town. It's like uh, being a footballer. It's like being a footballer in a World Cup and then being seen out and about. You know, it's you're, you're invited to all the VIP parties. You've got so much to be getting on with. And that's why fencers are quite lucky because our event is always at the beginning. You know, I think they want to get fencing out the way early. Could you imagine if you did the marathon that finishes on the last day? They literally get their medal in the closing ceremony. So if you're on later on in the programme, you probably don't get that enjoyment. So I think fencing is quite well placed. You have your event early and then you can... Uh, watch other sports and enjoy yourself and like things like the opening ceremony and closing ceremony you know they're they're a huge event as well and you know i i guess they won't be being done at tokyo and i mean that's that's usually one of as you say if you're towards the the, the latter part of the olympic games you can enjoy the opening ceremony if you're one of the first you can stay and enjoy the closing ceremony so you get one of two if you're something in the middle you actually get to enjoy both and that whole um it, you know that environment of, a, of an opening or closing ceremony is a kind of celebration of sport and and almost a, a reason to be like well this is why i'm here you know so that's that's quite quite a, a big thing i can imagine but i think also one of the, the things that really interests me is the idea that some people online have been talking about the the, the, the Olympic Games being such a huge um, celebration of sport and embracing um, all, all people from all over the world competing, but also having the kind of the, the, the higher, faster, stronger kind of approach of, of ultimately elite sport at its best. I know that fencing has obviously its selection process or qualification process has changed over the years. Well, what's your kind of take on that and, and how that's happening? And, and also that we're seeing, you know, medalists from like the African continent, which you would have never have seen 50 years ago. What's your kind of take on the whole qualification process? Yeah, it's an interesting one, the, the qualification. I think... You know, I, I've just been looking at some of the people that have been qualified. You know, qualification is pretty much done. We've still got the Pan American zonals to come. Uh, mm -hmm. So a few more names to come in. But having look at, looked at uh, the list of qualified athletes, three countries dominate uh, the Olympic program. If you think about USA, uh, Italy, and uh, what's the other one? Uh, Russia. They've qualified full contingents. So they've got everyone you know a whole team qualified in all six events so 18 people plus you'd have traveling reserves so you have actually 24 people from those countries getting kitted up getting measured for their olympic suit i mean it's, it's a massive team and if you add up the amount of people they got qualified it's uh it's, it's just over a quarter of all fencing competitors are from just those three countries and then if you look at the first 10 countries to qualify either because they're world-class countries in fencing or because they're from a weak continent, or because of a mixture of the two things. You know, so you're looking at Canada, they, you know, they would have almost 10 people in the team, USA, Egypt, uh, South Korea, China, Japan, then you know, Hungary, European ones that are hard hitters. The top 10 qualifiers make up about two thirds of the, the qualified uh, fences in an Olympic Games. And then the other 30 countries are the, the remaining third. So the, the trouble is now, fences are getting a little bit disillusioned with the whole thing because it's quite it's disproportionately difficult to get someone into the olympics if you don't have a team you know like you know, we were celebrating when we got this extra set of medals in uh, into the fencing program and I, I agree it looked very ugly to say right you sit out this time we'll sit out next time that's that's a very ugly solution but really you know if you don't have a team that's going to qualify getting having an extra team event is not a good thing just think at the zonals last weekend it would have been four people that qualified as opposed to one. So to, to have to win that zonal, to, to have to finish first out of 25 people, it's, uh, it's just disproportionately difficult in comparison to the, the teams. What do you think? Do you, do you think that that is actually the case? Because surely fewer people would have been going in events that didn't have a medal anyway, before all the medals were introduced. I mean, I know that other sports have benchmarks. So I think like, I think swimming, 
sprinting, you know, kind of athletic events? The the good countries would be limited to two. So the, the good countries wouldn't be happy with uh, not having a team because you remember in Beijing, for example, the Italians were limited to two. Everyone was limited to two, but the Italians had, you know, four absolutely world-class athletes. So the bigger countries are not happy if there's no team, but the smaller countries, it actually benefits them. It's, it's in their interest if there's no team because it's a little bit more lenient to get people in through the, the continental uh, qualifiers. The other problem that people have uh, spotted, like I know Alex Nadolo after the EPE event last weekend, she put a very sort of dignified email on a uh, post on Facebook saying, it's just bizarre that, the team event has any kind of influence on the individual. These are really two different sports. The team event is one thing, the individual is another, but the qualification is interlinked. I mean, it, it's just as absurd the way they do it as if you were to switch it round, turn it on its head, right? Imagine you qualified 36 individuals and you said, right, if you can make up a team, then you can have the right to fence in the team event. The two things are, are not related, yet if you qualify a team, you can then enter three people to the individual. You know, there are some real gaps in this uh, thought process with the Olympic qualification. I'm only saying it now because I'm retired. You know, obviously, me personally, I've had a, a very lucky, you know, innings with the, the wild card and, and, and getting qualified. I, I have got nothing to complain about personally, but it's just I'm looking at the system as a whole. It's a good reflection is, piece, right, which is the yeah. kind of understanding that, you know, uh, as you say, you, 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 I think actually, Richard, you could probably argue that you've gone through every single possible route to the Olympic Games, through the world ranking, through the zonals, a wild card, um, through team. Team, yeah, that's right. You've done, you've done almost every kind of entry to the Olympic Games. And, yeah. and that puts you in a great place to reflect on the qualification process. And, and obviously, uh, as um, Nadolo uh, very, very well wrote uh, the following day on, on Facebook, um, and, and actually this is at, at nobody's kind of expense talking about this, but... But, but people having the experience that you have can only reflect and hopefully make the system better for all. And I suppose mm. from my point of view, when I look at it and think, well, for example, as you say, if you have a team like Italy or USA that potentially have arguably five people in the, in the world ranked top 16 in the world and their team qualifies and only four will go, their fifth person that arguably, say, 12th in the world is not going to the Olympic Games, wherein and actually arguably could say, well, you know, the, the, the individual event is now weaker because you haven't got that, that fifth person who's also incredibly high in the world ranking. And, and yes, of course, that would offset it by having these super nations, having more athletes there. But again, where do we find that balance between having an inclusive Olympic Games where we get representation from the whole world and, and where do we do it where we also get... The, the, the thing is, right, if you said top, uh, say top 36 in the world, you know, 36 people there or thereabouts in the individual. If you said top 36 people in the world ranking, maybe limit it to three or four per country because that's the same as a world champs. And, you know, like you said, you need, uh, you know, proper representation from around the globe. Um, if you did that, you'd still have participation from all continents you'd still have El Sayed from Africa you'd still have Toldo you know world-class fencer from South America you'd still have representation from everywhere mm. but you, you I mean look have, have you noticed with this system you could in theory be number two in the world ranking you could be reigning world champion and mathematically it's possible you wouldn't go to the Olympics if number one was from your country and you didn't qualify a team yeah, so right. it, it's improbable but nevertheless there are gaps within the the system and, you know, if you look at the EPE, there's a Polish uh, fencer who's number 14 in the world and he's, his team didn't qualify. He didn't qualify in the zonal and now he's not going to the Olympics. And you just start to think it, it's getting a little bit, as I said, it's disproportionately difficult to get your foot in the door if you don't have a team. I think my answer was something that was uh, rejected by the IOC, apparently, because it contravenes their charter. But really, you've got two different sports. You've got team fencing and you've got individual fencing. Mm. And I think the qualification should just be different for each one. And I, I reckon if you put this to a vote to the, the wider fencing community, they would all vote for this. I think they should do top 36 in the world, four per nation. Then you go home from the Olympics if you're not in the team. You stay on if you're in the team. Other fencers come that are in the team event and then maybe top 12 teams in the world compete in the, in the team event. Now, the trouble is the IOC aren't happy with that because in their charter, if you're in the Olympics, you have the right to then stay after your event to watch all the other events. It's part of the, you know, the code of the IOC and to protect the athletes, to give them the Olympic experience. But I reckon fencers would go for that because I reckon that's uh, be a slightly fairer way to do it. And it would be perfectly inclusive as well. If you have a team going to 
certain events, it doesn't have to be the same team as the individuals that were there. You know, I've, mm. I've, I've seen it on paper. Yeah, you know, sure. ben, ben has flown in to replace somebody. Oh yeah, look, we've done that in the, the British. We've so, done that in the British team loads of times. We've you know we've had someone for the individual, flown them home, had someone else who was better in the team. So yeah, we, actually, we, that was my my first world championships. I uh, my first ever senior world championships. I was flown in just for team, um, you know. And actually, I, th- I believe the selection for European champs just done recently for Saber. There'll be two uh, guys competing individually, um, and only one athlete going for team. And then they're going to see based on on the results there. So it, it does happen. Um, and, and it's an interesting proposal you put forward. And I think that it would, you know, a lot of athletes potentially would support that. But but you're right. It's trying to get that Olympic experience. It's too. But but again, you have that argument between the, the different events. But I, I guess, obviously, you know, the Olympic movement has been one massive part of your or your career. But, you know, this fencing has taken you across the globe. And talking about Facebook, I think a lot of people have enjoyed some of the travels that you've done, but also the kind of the, the travel blogging that you've done and some of your, your greatest experiences. What, what, what was the kind of travel blogs that you've done or vlogs, sorry, because they are videos. What, what, what was the best one for you? What was the greatest experience from your travels? Well, I've done my uh, preparation for this interview, Pegsy, and look nice. what my wife got me. She got me a little scratch map. Excellent. So see if you can see that. So these are the places I've been to on the planet. So Excellent. I mean, I imagine you've got quite a lot of countries racked up. I've counted the ones I've been to. Obviously, it's quite hard to count to exactly. I mean, do you include the host nations of the UK? Do you include Hong Kong as a country, Macau? But roughly, I've been to about sixty-five countries. Wow. So I imagine you've been to what forty to fifty because you know fencers yeah. do travel a lot. They do the training camps and around the world. Um, but yeah, these little uh, adventures I've been doing, they've been keeping me uh, quite fresh and uh, quite enthused. I've always tried to, you know, instead of just going to the same place each year, which can get a little bit repetitive because the, the circuit's been quite similar for a long time. I always tried to put a little extra trip on uh, and just, you know, just take a little tour out the way. And of course, you get the funding to travel there because you're going for the competition. But then you just pay a little bit extra out of your own pocket just to, to deviate somewhere else and have a look at, you know, whatever tickles your fancy how much extra time would you normally add on to a trip i mean what do you normally have a plan or is it as as and when depending it depends on what, what yeah it depends what you do if it's like the last one of the year uh if it's you know after the world champs or the olympics or something then you, you've got loads of time to play with if it's before a competition i mean you could use the trip as a sort of uh mechanism to deal with the jet lag so you can go out a little bit earlier do your trip but you're actually acclimatizing to the same time zone um like I did one once, I got so fed up of uh, going to the Far East and dealing with the, the jet lag, which is, is quite difficult to deal with. It's quite a tough thing. So I remember after our competition in St. Petersburg, we had two weeks. So I just kept going east, step by step across the, you know, like the Stan countries. And then I dealt with the jet lag step by step incrementally. And by the time I got to Shanghai for the next uh, Grand Prix, I was already, you know, ready rather than having flown back. So, and you went, no? Is that correct? Yeah, I remember I won. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> all, that, all that living up in the Kazakh mountains, you know, a bit of, <laughs> bit of a, was it altitude training or something? Yeah. yeah, it must have increased my red blood cell count or something. Yeah, so you can actually use them to your advantage. Um, you know, I, I really enjoy doing them. And sadly, it looks like they're going to be off for a while because mm. you can't go anywhere. It's illegal yeah. to travel right now. Because you and James have obviously done a lot of that, like, you know, James Davis yeah. being a close teammate. And, you know, I think... I, James, loved... is, James is more adventurous than I am. He likes going to all these weird places more than me. You know, he's always saying, oh, when's the next one? When are we going to Belarus? When are we doing this? But the big one you guys want to do is the Trans-Siberian Express, right? That's the kind of, like... Yeah, and it was like... planned. It was bloody planned, you know. I was no, going right. to do it. I don't think James actually had the time, because, you know, James has to work very hard in the States, so I think he's on a bit of a time budget. But I was going to do it with Simon Semft and... Uh, Anton Bioskin. We had it all planned. Bioskin, wow. He's <laughs> yeah, we, we were going to go from uh, St. Petersburg, again, across Asia to Shanghai. And then Simon Semp was going to do a bit of sparring with me on the train. You know, we're going to make a little video. It was, it was all planned. And then this bloody COVID thing came along and and it was all off. Oh, how annoying. But you're also, you're, you're quite a, a linguist, aren't you? So I've heard stories about you speaking many languages and loving to be kind of really a, a dive into the, whatever culture you're in. Yeah, yeah, I'm a, I'm a cunning linguist. So how many languages do you, do you speak? Um, well, to, to a basic level, well, English... Well, I, will, I will just say, before we started recording, Go we on. heard you speaking what sounded to me like perfect Spanish. It is perfect Spanish. <laughs> Cuba, Cuban Spanish, so Cuban Spanish. whether they speak Spanish in Cuba or not is still a, still a debate. I'm not sure if they do. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually a good question in linguistics. 
when is a dialect another language? You know, some people consider Scottish to be a different language to English. They seriously, do. And uh, some place you go I mean, in Scotland, it seems yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, you know, honestly, yeah. And uh, I mean, uh, one time I tell you a true story. I was I was in Cuba and I was watching a documentary on Cuban telly about Usain Bolt, and they were interviewing his parents. And they were speaking in a very heavy sort of Jamaican accent, Jamaican patois. And I ended up reading the Spanish translations, even though they were speaking in English. <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? When, when is a dialect another language? You know, and there are other times where there, there are two languages that are identical, but because they're neighbours that want their own independence, their own, uh, well, they're, they're politically different. They claim to speak different languages like Serbian, Bosnian, um, Croatian. They're all, you know, pretty similar. But they all mm. say they have a different language, Romanian and Moldovan as well. They say they have a different language, but ling linguists don't accept it. So there are some interesting debates. So what do I speak? I speak English in my mother tongue. I speak Spanish to my wife. I'll bring her down later. Hungarian to a conversational level, basic Russian and even more basic Arabic. I've just started. Well, I started about five years ago on the Arabic. But and actually, Arabic is an interesting one. Arabic is absolutely not one language. Arabic is a whole range of languages. But all the Arab countries, they want, they've got a sort of common uh, identity because they're all Muslims, you know, they're Middle East, North Africa. They, wanna, they say they speak the same language, but they really don't. And when I was at university, I remember we had an Egyptian and we had a Syrian and they used to speak in English to each other. And I said, why don't you speak Arabic? He said, oh, I don't speak the same Arabic as him. It's not the same language. <laughs> <laughs> That's that, amazing. Right. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? But no one really knows that. There are some languages that yeah. are secretly different languages. Yeah. Do you know, I think, so I, when I went to Malta, I discovered that I think Maltese is, is very close to Arabic. But, Mal uh, okay. but, Maltese, but in the Latin alphabet. Maltese is the only dialect of Arabic that's considered a different language. And that's wow. probably because they're wow. Christian. They, they want an affiliation to the European Union rather, rather than the Arab League. And you're right, it's, uh, it's, they're sort of Latinized Arabs, aren't they? They write it in the Latin script. There's a lot of Italian that's gone in there. Yeah, it's the, yeah, it's the same as the other dialects. You know, like f there's a lot of French in Tunisian. There's a bit of Italian in Libyan, uh, a bit of Portuguese in, in uh, Saudi Arabic, you know, Arabic from the, the Gulf. So, yeah, it is fascinating when you, you start to... So it means you can survive pretty much anywhere because, I mean, obviously you've done all these travels, not only with fencing, but obviously something you enjoy is the explanation of, but you can, you can survive anywhere, Richard, you know, Spanish I, in, in Romania, you said like, you know, you can kind of get by with a little bit of that. That's incredible. The fact that you could go anywhere in the world and pretty much get by. Romania is funny. Romania is really funny because, you know, I try in English. Sometimes they speak English. Sometimes they don't. Then there's lots of Hungarians in Romania. So I try in Hungarian. Sometimes that, that doesn't work. So then I try in Spanish and then I put the odd Russian word in and I've sort of got everything and nothing in Romania. <laughs> yeah, all I, all I need now is a bit of French, a bit of uh, Chinese. And then really, there's not many places I couldn't go to in the world. I could mm. probably help you with that. I, felt, I discovered in Bucharest, which yeah. I went to the satellite a few years ago. Mm. So Bucharest is actually styled on Paris. Yeah, like the Arc de Triomphe in the... It, the exactly. Yeah. And there are lots of the older generations. So people so parisians the french used to travel to bucharest for like their summer holidays so they kind of replicated mm. lots of france there oh, really quite so similar and lots of the older generation kind of which are now grandparents you know speak kind of fluent french which mm. which i found to be quite surprising did you see the palace the massive Ceausescu's? uh it's insane i've never seen a building so big it's bizarre isn't it? i remember i was there 2012 after the olympics i went traveling around europe and i went to a lot of countries including romania so i, w I was walking up to the palace and it's like an optical illusion. I thought I was right next to it. And then another few miles down the road, it was still you know, way off. I think it's the, sec <laughs> the second biggest building in the world by area, only to second to the Pentagon. Yeah. Isn't I mean, that it's where they did the Top Gear racing in the tunnels? Yeah, underneath in the it. tunnels underneath. Yeah. yeah but I mean, it's, it's grotesque. And if you look at how they built it, they, uh, so Ceausescu was, you know, complete dictator of Romania. People were starving. And yet he built this massive marble palace made people work 12 hour shifts so 12 hour shifts and then the next the night shift would come so there was constant work on it and you know you can't use it for anything it's just too big they were actually considering whether they should uh, demolish the thing because it's grotesque but wow yeah, interesting really interesting. but actually that's one of the things is for you is 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 your 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 knowledge of 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 so many things and actually well, I, I enjoy our conversations so much because we find out I find out so much from you not only because you're a fencing encyclopedia um, but also <laughs> because of just your knowledge of traveling and, and languages and having been to these places and explored it oh, and, and actually, when, when, when I want to know how to use the iPhone then I get your knowledge well you know? quite yeah I know and it's my <laughs> skills are limited these days but yeah absolutely can we can we just touch on that very quickly because I've heard 
that you don't have a smartphone at all. Is that right? No, no, it's not. I've got one. Look, here it is. So we got this from the Olympics. This was the Olympic edition. It's a, uh, it's a limited edition. It's got like the Olympic rings on the back. So it's really, when I take it into the shop, they're really interested because you, you can't buy that one. But well, it's a Samsung. It's not an iPhone. <laughs> uh, Okay, so what do I? What am I trying to say? Smartphone? Is that what I mean? No, no. That, I mean that, that's a yeah, that's a Samsung okay. smartphone, isn't it? So, really, so I meant, I meant, I meant uh, you know, like smartphone with the internet and all that. So I had this old brick that I kept using, <laughs> and I refused to use the the new model, and it had its benefits. Do you remember Ben when we used to go to competitions, and then the management would say. Hey, you are. I've got you on WhatsApp. Here, I'm going to send you a message. I say sorry, don't have a. Don't have a smartphone. Do you remember I was, getting in trouble, I was getting in trouble once? And, and uh, you know, she was laying into me, the old boss. And I said, you know what? Just send me a WhatsApp. <laughs> she went <laughs> mental with And uh, anyway, so I didn't want to upgrade to a smartphone. But we got this one from the Olympics. And then after 2016, I went camping. And I left the bloody thing outside charging. And it started raining. So then I upgraded to a smartphone. But it was under duress, I should tell you these phones back then they would last forever wouldn't they and you know you, you kind of sneeze on one of these phones these days and you crack the screen on they, they get damaged but it's quite funny talking they're, they're only you know we've, we've had the pleasure of having a smartphone has meant we've been able to record some funny incidences and I, going back to some of the travels we were talking about mm. there, there was a quite a funny incident that as sharing an anecdote um with both richard and james and i have to be careful the way i kind of like talk about this for the delegate i know, I know what you're going to say <laughs> maybe listening to this podcast but um you know richard and james their love of travel and, and also has kind of given me the bug for it we used to have a competition in south korea and so richard said oh guys we must go and see the, the border between North and South Korea. And I said, wow, that sounds great. So we, uh, we jumped in a cab and we, we drove, uh, you know, the best part of, you know, an hour and a half, two hours to um, the, the DMZ, the demilitarized zone between North and South Korea. An amazing experience. We got there, we got to look into the no man's land. We got to look into North Korea, all that kind of stuff. And, and actually our cabbie that had taken us there very kindly um, decided to, to wait for us until we were done with the day. So anyway, we thought, oh, this amazing experience. We've had a really good day at the DMZ. So we got back in the cab and we were driving back to back to, 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 to Seoul. And as we were on, on the route there, you know, the cabbies start to get to know us a little bit. So we got caught in traffic. So it was taking longer. And he said, oh, you know, in his broken English, he said, do you mind if I smoke? And we were like, no, 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 we'd rather rather you didn't. We're athletes. We're competing, that kind of stuff. Anyway, he then uh, he then said, OK, well, I will put on a movie, a special, special movie. And he had a little like this kind of little Arcos like TV thing in the front of, uh, of the cab. And we're like, yeah, OK, cool. Sounds good. James was sitting in the front and myself and Richard in the back. And this is where the smartphone comes in. What he then put on that screen, I had to film everyone's reaction. So we were sat in traffic with uh, like solid traffic. Everyone looking in. You've got like three Westerners and this guy. He's not smoking, but he's pointing heavily at his TV, laughing and enjoying himself while he's put on some hardcore pornography with the three of us sitting there. Like, what have we suddenly found ourselves in? And I had to film Richard and James's reaction because the guy's sitting there laughing, pointing, loving it, looking at James and Richard and myself trying to get a good reaction. We're utterly stunned by what is. And it was have looking you, into the cab. Have you, Ben, have you still got that uh, video footage that you took or is that long gone? I'll have to find it. It's definitely somewhere in the depths of my computer, but I just, I couldn't believe it. I, I've definitely got it somewhere. Along with one of our training camps in Bath with, um, with where, uh, where Pete Barwell, uh, bless him, one of a teammate, one of Dare, uh, cracked uh, like several eggs and, and, and and like the whole Rocky thing and drank all the eggs. It's, it's in there somewhere. I've got so much footage. Oh, it's so, so many stories. And I, and I think that was a very uh, edited, uh, modest version of the story that you gave, Ben. It was uh, in, in Seoul. It was actually... Uh... Yeah, it was, it was quite, made me feel sick actually. Seeing yeah, so it was quite was. heavy, heavy uh, yeah. stuff, which I think we were stunned by. But he was enjoying himself. We weren't expecting that. But they're the kind of things that sometimes happen along trips that uh, that actually make the kind of team bonding experience something that uh, you know that, that's 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 really great. And and yeah, yeah the, the Barber one, I remember. I remember he he said, right, I I bet I can drink twelve eggs. So he put them all in a cup, like you said, <laughs> like Rocky. He said, right, I bet all of you are fiver. So we all put a fiver down. And then he just drank them. Yeah, amazing. Held, held it down for a few minutes, took all our money, and then went and vomited. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. it was a bit lawless back then, but we had had did have some good times. So, but I mean, obviously, we've done all that traveling together and, and, and you know, the training and competition. But, you know, if, if there was ever a way that we could talk about, you know, your kind of, 
your, your training and competition philosophy. What I know you mentioned routines and stuff, but you've always seemed very kind of relaxed in, in your training environment, very relaxed in your competitive career. Uh, and is that born out of thousands of hours of doing it? Is it born out the fact that you also try and make the trips um, uh, uh, something that is more than just fencing? What is kind of the, the what 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 ticks along in your head when in some of the most precious situations that I've seen you in? You seem very well, cool, calm, he, and collected. I, I think it's a bit of a journey, you see, because when I was young, I was very hot headed. I mean, you know, I got black carded for swearing at the referee once. I was like, uh, I was a bit like, uh, you know, how JJ Webb was in training, I, and he's calmed down a little bit now. But you know how he was? He used to chuck his mask, and then you go downstairs, and someone would smash the door off the hinges, and it was JJ Webb who was angry. So I used to be a, a little bit like that. And uh, I mean, it's quite sweet looking back. We were just trying so hard. Mm. You know, as kids, we were breaking our brains. We just didn't really know how to cope with uh, losing and the frustration. And it's a journey you go on to sort of control this piece of uh, hardware that you have. Um, so, yeah, earlier on, I was a, a bit of a hothead. But, you know, towards the end, it's just managed to just sort of step back a little bit and just concentrate on what I was doing whilst, whilst being a little bit detached from it. I mean, you know what it's like when you lose. It's like a, it's like a breakup. When you win, it's euphoric. Mm. It's, uh, it, it can be quite hard, you know, for youngsters to deal with that kind of uh, stress. Do wins or losses tend to affect who you are at home, or how easy you are to live with, for example, or has that changed over time? Do you want to ask my wife? <laughs> we can. Entra, muchacha, entra, entra, sienta, baby. Mira. Okay, so they want to know when I lose, am I more angry at home? Uh, no, he's the no, same. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm a flatliner. He's, flat flat uh, he's very calm. Um, yeah, he tried to keep it for himself. Okay. That's great. I think, I think he keep it for himself. Mm. So he's very, easy, but, he's very easy to live with. Yeah, yeah but yeah. but you know, it's it's like a bit of a culture clash because obviously Yvonne is from the Caribbean, <laughs> a little bit fiery. So the first bit of anger and there's an explosion but then you know five <laughs> minutes later she simmers down but it's amazing because we, we have a, a richard and i had a former teammate uh, and now a, i guess a competitor alex toffolides who we mm. who we love dearly and uh, and and he he was kind of what we spoke about earlier on the little little hothead uh, when he was younger but actually as he's got older he's mellowed somewhat but it's still the fiery one in 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 the training center and i can imagine yeah. living with with toffolides bless him um on on a good day or a bad day you kind of get that mm. under but it's so good to hear that Richard is is cool, calm, and collected, irrespective of the results that happen on the field. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. Di didn't didn't Toff fence well at the weekend? Did you see his matches? Oh, oh it was amazing! Yeah. It was incredible. he fenced really well. You know, he beat that Georgian guy who was uh, gonna, always going to be a tricky customer. He mm. beat uh, CS, who was the best on paper in that zonal. He then beat Claude, uh, who's a world class fencer. And I could see at the end of that match with Claude that he was, Toff was just cramping up a little bit. He was getting a little bit fatigued. And then by the time he fenced Jupinich, it was, to be honest, it was a walkover, wasn't it? He was... Uh yeah, it was, was challenging. Uh, Actually, was I said to uh, I messaged Toff, and and I know that he's, um, you know, I, I must say on on all of our behalves, we were amazingly impressed, and we, he was he was the the horse we ruled backing. But I know he's he's very much struggling at the moment. Bless him, having returned. So we must take him for a round of snooker or a beer just to yeah, to let's, go a for, let's go for a bit of snooker. You know, I've got something to mention. In fencing, people are using the injury break now. Everyone's using it as a timeout. Why don't they just have it as a timeout? Why do you have to now? fake you've got a cramp or gone over in your ankle people are just using it when their their concentration's gone mm. and they're sort of doing you know time out like in america i reckon the fie should just change it just say right do a time out then because people are only going to just lie and use it for that benefit anyway it's kept changing right from like 10 minutes to five minutes five minutes yeah five now minutes it's shorter uh, and yeah you're right i've and and actually speaking of of Going back to what we were talking about earlier on about the Olympic Games, you know, you've got this whole thing where you've got um, the fourth man at the Olympic Games or fourth fourth lady doesn't doesn't if they don't if they don't compete if they may be there in the box and fencing like for example if you're part of a four man team at the World Championships and you don't fence for the entire day if your team wins you you are on the podium as well at the Olympic Games if you're in the box and part of the team but don't compete or step foot on the on the fencing piece and the team wins a medal the fourth person doesn't go up and so actually what you tend to find is that those teams that when they get to the final that when they have a big enough gap in the in the scores somebody feigns an injury brings their fourth person on for the last two touches to make sure they get a medal and so you have to start to question again going back to the Olympic games like is that a is that okay do we do we do we not allow the fourth person because again richard you'd probably attest to this that actually that fourth person they may not fence on the day at the olympic games but they've had a huge um, impact on the team qualifying 
um, over the last four years, usually. So that's also another kind of grey area. You, you're talking about your Baku medal, aren't you, Pegsy? That's well, I mean, you know, that's, it. I mean, that's it's true as well, you know. Yeah, okay. but... Well, it's a difficult one because, you know, if someone doesn't fence on the day, it's, it can be quite hard to give them a medal. But then, like you said, the, the other side is you, people just pretend to roll their ankle and they bring someone on for one point. And, you know, I've literally seen that a few times in my career. I remember in Athens, I think Nassib Berlin wasn't fencing that well. So they told him to, you know, take probably, they, they probably told him to take a dive in the first, you know, 10 seconds. So he got on, fence, you know, one phrase. I don't even know if there was a hit, then fell over, came off and then ended up with a bronze medal. Same with Vessels in uh, London. You know, they brought him on for one hit. He went over the back line, then he scored a point, and there you go, bronze medal. But like you said, you know, they obviously put a lot of work in to get the team qualified, and it was a team effort behind the scenes. So, yeah, that, that's also a fair point, yeah. It seems really odd considering the medal was, is there anyway. The, the yeah, medal was they, already what, sitting there in the venue, so why wouldn't you hand it out? And the what do they do with it? <laughs> what, what do they do with it? Does it go to a, auction it off? Does it go to the Olympic Museum or something? Yeah, I don't know. It's 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 a really it's a really interesting one. Oh, but... I've got I've got a good story for you. Okay, you know, uh, mentioning the Olympic Museum and uh, Alexander Nadolo earlier, I remember I had a, a competition in Switzerland, and I remember Britta Heidman asked Lawrence and me if we wanted to come with her and uh, Alex Nadolo to the, the Olympic Museum because we were. We were in, I think, Montreux, and the Olympic Museum was in, uh, where is it? It's Lausanne. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, being an Olympic buff, I went along. We got there, and we asked how much it was to get in, and it, it cost a fortune to get in. Huh. Uh, but the woman mentioned in passing, uh, if you're an Olympian, you can come in for free. Oh, no. So, ooh, so great. So we all said, yeah, we're all Olympians. So we all signed the, <laughs> all signed the piece of paper, <laughs> including uh, Nadolo as well, even though she hadn't been. And... Uh, and we managed to get in. I think Britta just dis, uh, distracted them by saying, "It could be an Anna Olympic winner. It happened a gold medal to do it here. Uh, yeah, of course. And, you won Beijing, didn't she? Yeah, and they loved it. And they let us in. But, you know, Nadolo did a little scam to get in. But uh, I think <laughs> that was a great yeah. museum. Really liked it. I'd love to go and see it. I think it would be in- incredible to see some of the some of the results. Yeah, and they, again, they've got loads of medals from all the years, all showcased, uh, you know, loads of artifacts. It really is you know, worth a visit, actually. But actually, being as you say, being an Olympic buff, there are there. What what obviously I love about this interview is we're getting to find out more about you, and, and actually there is uh, obviously your languages, your love of travelling as well. Um, but there, there's obviously lots of extracurricular activities you you participate in. One of them being the fact that you play the bagpipes. And actually, we've had many occasions we've done an event in Scotland, and you've come come in and presented playing the bagpipes and actually before you answer that question Yvonne do you find that Richard gets the whole bagpipes out and plays at home or does he just use his special flute he gives uh, bagpipe lessons so that's a good time for him to practice with the whole equipment okay uh, when when they are doing the lessons but at home it's more quiet like with the flute but not just at home if we are traveling or we are in a train or something we use it take that time to to practice and not just that, anything like languages. Yeah. Well, you know, I used to play in the park. There's a little, you know, park down the road from us. And it, I, what I really liked about it was that half the people would hate what I was doing. Half the people would love it. <laughs> but the people that loved it would come up to me and say, oh, I've got a Scottish grandparent. I love it. It reminds me of the Highlands. And, and they, they were really into it. But the people that didn't like it wouldn't say anything. Except okay. for sometimes they did. But they, they said... They showed their dislike in a very English way. I mean, the woman came up to me and said, oh, it's very loud, isn't it? And I said, yeah, do you like it? She said, well, it's just that we could hear it from right over there. I said, oh, did you like it? She said, yeah, it was just that we were sleeping and it came on and it was, it was a little bit loud. <laughs> Amazing. I remember having a go. You, you kindly, kindly showed me how to, to do it in the garden at Keith's house. And then we did, and then again, actually, when we did the, yeah, the yeah, yeah. ceremony, or at the, at, the, at the end, sorry, actually, you called me up and we had a go and we all had a go. It's incredibly, uh, it, it requires a huge amount of lung capacity and a lot of coordination with the arm as well. Yvonne, have you, have you tried at all to play? Oh, I think at, at some time I try to, but it's so, so hard, really difficult. Yeah. You, yeah. you have to be tra- uh, that, that's why, training for that. If you look at pipers, they're actually really solid in the upper body because they need a lot of strength to, to keep the things going. You know, it's a really, it's a warring instrument. I remember, do you remember we went, we drove up to Keith's Cook, uh, Keith Cook's camp uh, a few years back and the whole way 
the two of us, we should have recorded it. We just started to slip a wee little bit into the... Just started to relax the accent a wee little bit. More. Hey, that we did. Well, it was really funny, actually, because Lucy, my, my girlfriend, was in the car, and she was like, we had we had the, the two of you taking the mickey out of uh, Keith Cook's accent the whole way home for six hours, bless her. But I tell you what, we should start... Did she try? Did she try the accent? Oh, you, hey, bless her, she's you, terrible at accents. <laughs> were you there when we got well, I got busted for doing Keith Cook impressions? Oh, yeah, we were in the German sauna, weren't we? Yeah, do you remember? We were, <laughs> we were in a German sauna because uh, we, we were in Austria in Salzburg doing a training camp. And I think we went with Rene Prance and a few others. They took that us over it. the border to, um, to, to one in, you know, in Bavaria, in Germany. And uh, we were in this sort of like dome uh, <laughs> salt cave. And then we started doing the Keith accent, like, come on, you little lad, go for you, bite your ankles, let me out of Uncle Scooby. <laughs> and then this went on for about 10 minutes, and then eventually <laughs> some German that wasn't part of our group, some old man, just cracked. Shut the opposite about the Keith Cook and got here in the ear, the Keith Cook, come on. He was not happy, he was not, I think Keith was with us, actually. But I mean, yeah, it was very funny. <laughs> but you know what? You would actually, as 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 Chris is a, an honorary Scotsman, um, you know, maybe you should start teaching him the bagpipes, you know, and, and get him with the get him going, get the lung capacity <laughs> and the arm going. I think I think Chris, you'd be quite good. It would suit you very well. There we go. I'm not very musical, it has to be said. So apart from the bagpipe paying, because I yeah. know obviously, as Yvonne said, you, you do teach, and and you were doing a lot of work with the with the scout groups. Is that right? Well, no, I, I taught uh, this. I learned in the scouts, and then you know, a few, about ten years ago, the scout master said, uh, "Would you want to?" Would you mind coming back and teaching whoever wants to learn? And in return, you can use the hall, you know, to practice when you want now and then. So I said yes. And I had two students. One dropped out and I had another one that did it for a while. But I actually haven't seen him for about a year because because uh, COVID, all, all the scouting's closed down. Of course. So I'm just, just waiting for them to open up shop again. Again, there's more There's more to you than just the bagpipes. You've got the, the Wing Chun, a uh, martial art that you practice. Yeah. At, ha, I'm guessing you haven't been able to do that for about a year as well. No, you, we haven't been able to do that because that's like fencing, isn't it? It's pro like the combat sports and arts in close proximity. So actually Wing Chun's probably one of the worst ones for transmitting because you're, you're in contact with their forearms and you're, you're a few feet away from them. Uh, so that's all off. It's not starting up uh, until next month yeah <laughs> i in fact i re i saw recently richard got a little little cl clip to the eye as well by, uh, by <laughs> yeah, <accident. that's> my <laughs> <laughs> yeah, little, little play fight <laughs> so scary was that day <laughs> yeah yeah but i know anyway. the top ladies is, is is one that loves a good play fight and uh and not so started... much now not so much now but he used to he used to be a little bit hyperactive you remember top ladies we used to have to absolutely Just sort him out a bit yeah <laughs> with your wing chung it's amazing because actually a lot of the stuff that you used to talk about with james's dad as well because he had a lot of uh, involvement with yeah, martial ja arts too james's dad is a he's a real martial arts uh, buff you know i've been around his house a few times to get treatment because he's a physio as well so he, he used to give me a bit of treatment and uh, he's got a whole library of you know aikido uh, he's he does karate he does a filipino knife fighting art he does wing chun you know he's got a huge library of all these martial arts dvds and everything well VHS is because it's old school. And actually, to be honest, I know uh, obviously time time's getting on. And it's been amazing to to to, to talk and, and find out a bit more. I say the multifaceted personality that you have. What what would you say is kind of your greatest accomplishment, both on and off the piece? Finding finding my lady wife. Ah, <laughs> oh, that's me. Please don't poke me in the eye again. <laughs> <laughs> How long have you guys been married for now? God, it feels like 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Marie, 2017. 2017 okay. <laughs> so, I was the day, I was there the day you guys met. You were in Cuba? In, I was in Cuba that day, yeah. I no way! Day. Yeah, we when you met. Know. I'm and, pretty and Marcus, sure. Marcus as well. And Marcus, Toffolidis, yeah. all of us were, were there. You were in a competition? You were there in the swimming. Yeah. And Super Bowl, oh, we were trying oh, to do the handstand. The, the day we met? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Met, I, yeah. I, I do remember. I, I think this presents... <laughs> How did you meet? <laughs> oh, yeah. Go and tell the story. <laughs> uh, so I was uh, they they went to a competition in Cuba, and then by chance they were in the same hotel that I went with some friends, and I actually we we met these guys. I didn't see Richard at the beginning, <laughs> and we were like talking with with them. And Top is very friendly, and mm -hmm. he started trying to talk practicing his Spanish and then uh yeah at some point we set up like g going out of everybody and then he brought Richard and I've told this story in my wedding so basically he gave uh 
Yvonne and her group his number of the, the room. And uh, later on, Toff was out. And I got a call from Yvonne saying, uh, oh, we, I'm after Toff Alides. We're, we're trying to arrange, uh, you know, going to a bar or something. And, you know, I'm a little bit tight with the money. And it was 50p a text. <laughs> I thought, should I bother texting Toff? Should I tell him that someone's called for him? <laughs> oh, OK, I'll text him. And uh, if I didn't spend that 50p, the best 50p I've ever spent. <laughs> uh, look at that. Amazing. Amazing. And that, that was uh, that was after the competition, we may add, as well. We we'd all fence very hard. And so we got to, yeah. to relax at the end of the season as well. So, And you guys yeah. obviously got married in Cuba. Any plans for like a, a kind of British ceremony when things have started to lift? Yeah, I, that was the idea, wasn't it, originally? Because it was impossible mm. to get all the Brits out to Cuba. It's not practical. And then mm. even harder to get all the Cubans out to, you know, down here to London. So I think that's probably the best thing to do, just to have a little, well, not really a ceremony, just a sort of party, I suppose, um, just to get, yeah. you know, all my side along. Maybe we can do like a party for a far away for British at the same time, British ceremony. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <Everyone. laughs> Uh, oh, amazing. Right. so so greatest achievement off the piste being Yvonne greatest achievement on the piste uh, greatest one on the piste uh, yeah it, it's a tough one um, I I think probably that getting the world number one status even though it was just for two weeks just to occupy that world number one spot showed a, a lot of consistency so I'm really pleased with that but uh, also when I first qualified for the Olympics that was a, a massive deal remember mm -hmm. I didn't even sleep that night I was so so pumped up you know i just couldn't sleep i was uh just you know the endorphins you just can't explain what it's like to to really want to be part of that fraternity that brotherhood of olympic athletes and then mm -hmm. all of a sudden get your qualification and uh, i remember james williams go oh brother you've done so well you're gonna get measured up for your suit brother you can get on the podium you can do it in athens brother <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing that's well, well it's a, <clears throat> I, what I, the question i was gonna ask is about being world number one like did you Obviously, that happened relatively recently. I mean, take COVID away, you know, that's one year closer. Did you feel like World number one? Did you feel like the best? No, it didn't change anything afterwards. It was, uh, but, you know, on that season, on that run of form, and obviously it was a, in hindsight, it was perhaps a little bit foolish to push that hard when it was just outside of the Olympic qualifying period. Um, but it was actually in the back of my mind on the run up to it. Because I remember after I came second in the World Champs, I thought, well, it's probably not likely I'm going to, be world number one because I've still got to defend that victory in Cairo the next year and then Bond was the first one that season and I won it and I thought oh god this could, this could be on and then uh, I went to Paris I fenced really well just got edged out by mine height in Paris and then I kept that form on to uh, to Tokyo and had a very tough draw and I managed to do it so I you know on that year of, uh, of fencing I had a lot I had to do a lot of stuff to get that world number one position I had, you know second in the world champs I had three victories counting on the scoreboard, you know, Shanghai Grand Prix, uh, Bonn and Tokyo World Cups, and then a few 16s. And uh, then I only uh, surpassed Pocconi by a few points. So you really have to sweat blood to do it. But I was, I'm just pleased, you know, I can say I, I've done it once. It would have been nicer if it, was, if it was at the end of the season. It would have been a bit neater. But, you know, it doesn't matter. It's still at the end of the 10 tournaments. It's an accumulative ranking. Yeah, no, well, congratulations on that. And the, so the, my other question was going to be about when you first qualified, when you qualified to your first Olympic Games, did mm. that have an effect on your mindset or on your confidence? Yeah, I mean, I was actually quite confident on the run into Athens. I was fencing very well at that time. But there was a lot of talk, you know, saying, well, did, did Cruz really deserve it? And, you know, when I got up in the morning, I just I really, I, I was nervous before Athens, but I really wanted a fence, you know, because it, it's your first one, you've got nothing to lose. You want to prove the critics wrong. You want to show that you, you should have been there. And I remember I, you know, I fenced a, a pretty good co competition. Lost to Kasara, but he was, he was just another level then. I think he was actually world number one at the time. He was, uh, he was actually very unlucky not to win it. I think. Mm -hmm. no, I actually, I think that was before I started following fencing, so I don't really, <laughs> I don't mm -hmm. remember what happened. But just to go, so for for a lot of fencers on the, on the UK circuit you're a bit of a mythical being because, um, I mean, obviously you don't, you don't have, or you haven't had a lot of time, you know, to kind of compete domestically. And to be honest, you know, these bigger events are much higher priority. So what... oh, wait, hang on, you say that, but I did do the domestic circuit for, I don't know, five, six, seven years. Uh, yeah. The late nineties, I was doing the domestics. The <laughs> thing is, if you're getting results internationally, you don't then need to do the home circuit to qualify. Hmm. So generally it was the case that we just did the nationals just because you you know that's a, a title you should go for the national champion 
Um, but then you, you didn't need to do the Welsh Open, the Essex Open, all those things. I, I had done them on the way up, but then once yeah, I was making yeah. results internationally, it was just no. Of course, that, I think I think that makes sense. But I mean, certainly for me, when you know, when you, I think there was a period of time when that it. I don't know if maybe it was injury or it kind of nationals clashed with something, but you know there was a period of time for a few years where you know, and I was coming up through the rankings mm. that I never saw really any of the British team, and then they made mm. nationals a requirement, and it's actually for me that was really beneficial. But the reason I mention that is, um, I think a lot of fences as they're kind of climbing up through the rankings, and I think probably the same for you as you were going through the domestic circuit, is that fencing is a bit of an addiction and kind of a you mm. know a real passion, something that pulls you. But for you would you say your fencing has been an obsession or an addiction for you to have, or have you always been able to maintain a certain kind of distance from it? Yeah, I suppose we're all quite, we're all pretty much obsessed by it. It's just, it became a way of life really it just became what you, you did in your job. Um, but yeah, I really liked it as uh, at a young age, there is a slight danger of taking your hobby and making it into a profession. You know, for example, like if I tried to be a professional bagpipe player, player and you know people do that people go to competitions they devote their whole lives to to playing bagpipes and then of course you've got all the politics you may lose a bit of passion for the the hobby um if if you go down that route that that's one danger um but, you know on on the grounds of what you said before that i've become a mythical being i remember you know sometimes people would meet me that hadn't met me before and they say oh oh Oh, it's you, You're Richard Cruz. I was expecting someone seven foot tall with arms like tree trunks. <laughs> so I've got. And they I've see got me a, and they're disappointed. Like a William a Wallace story. figure in somebody's head. <laughs> I've got a funny story on something like this. So I, yeah, I remember I used to go to Central London Fencing Club down in Pimlico, and I remember going to Pimlico Station, and then you know, kind of, you, you know, you get on the station, you walk up the four minutes, yeah. or whatever it is, to get there. I don't know if you've ever been there. Anyway on the way in the short walk you know i saw this guy with a fencing bag and i thought oh look he looks like a fencer he must be looking for for central from the fencing club he you know maybe I'll, I'll show him the way i'll ask if he's all right anyway i said are you all, are you all right are you looking for this club and he said yeah yeah i am i said oh yeah it's just this way come you know come with me i was like so do you do you compete and he went yeah and i was like yeah. oh right and uh and do you compete quite a lot yeah oh and what like what was your last result <laughs> Last 32 at World Champs. <laughs> and it was Jamie Kemba. Oh, it was Kemba. 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 <laughs> but you, we just never saw. You know, we never saw. Actually, I think I'd fence him at Bristol the year before or something. But Kemba, yeah, I tell you, I think he was one of the most talented fencers. Yeah, he was exceptional. Uh, you know, I think he's a real underachiever, Kemba. I, I, I've won six uh, national titles uh, out of seven finals that I made. And the only one I didn't convert was against Kemba. I lost 15-14. He I was watched real... that when I was a kid. I was yeah. there in the stands as a baby. He was yeah, the he... youngest senior he... champion, wasn't he? Is he yeah. on the record? No, no, no. Hang on. That was me. That was me. I, I, I was actually... Am I confusing you? <laughs> I, I think I beat Kemba by a few months because I won it uh, four years earlier. So I was actually a few okay. months younger than Kemba. But, you know, Kemba was incredibly talented. And I don't... Do you remember, Pegs, when we went to uh, the old uh, Lee Valley setup? Mm. Uh, and we used to do all these physical prep, you know, things, all the physical training. We used to do eight, something like seven or eight, 200 meters around the track. Yeah. And Kemba was hilarious. In On the first one, he would destroy all of us by about quick. 10 meters. Really he was quick. quick, unbelievably explosive. But then he would fatigue very quickly. And by the second one, he would be almost like second last, third last. And then the remainder of them, he would be like, last and vomiting in the bin and <laughs> oh man I used to, uh, J jamie was is a lovely lovely human being and he was someone that i i always uh loved fencing and aspired to be like and actually it was quite funny so but his timekeeping was not always the sharpest and a couple of times he was late to those physical training sessions and i remember one day as a punishment our ssc instructor said right you must go over to that crash mat and do 100 burpees i think jamie got about 30 in and then had to run to the change rooms and find a bin because he was just ready to pop so he, it was always a bit of a struggle but Jamie was well, like we spoke about earlier on with with kind of luck in 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 a, in, a, in your kind of career Jamie was a particularly unlucky person with injury um, yeah. but yet yeah, hugely hugely um but you know, the, the, a talent Ben there's more to that story because he came in late he got the 100 burpees he vomited and then he said right I'm going home I can't take <laughs> anything yeah, he left. so he lasted <laughs> a few minutes in training back on the WA off <laughs> that's it God, Lee, actually, and Lee I, Valley was a long way I mean it's... and actually Chris you say that it was a long way so much so that where I used to live in Basingstoke my parents bless them allowed me to use their little motorhome that my dad used to take to racing and I parked it out the, the back because there was a little caravan park and the first day to training <laughs> I was late because I misread the schedule and I was the closest and, man there and, and you've made it into Croatian folklore uh 
you know, I that, have. That, thanks to you. I, thanks to you, you. and James, when, actually. When I was uh, training in Croatia, we did a, we used to do training camps in Zagreb with uh, Bojan Jovanovic. And one of the coaches told me that when their students don't try hard enough, they say there was a boy in Britain that tried so hard that his parents bought him a caravan so he could live <laughs> next to the fencing pool. And now you're not trying hard enough. <laughs> so you've made it into folklore. But that yeah, it's it. funny. I remember Lee Valley, it, was, uh, it wasn't actually that far from where we are now in North London. It was about five miles from here, but it took me about an hour and 45 minutes to get in because it was three buses. It was a very obscure yeah. place, like right out of the way. Yeah. But, you know, when you had the caravan, everyone would allowed to come around for a good bit of tea. And yeah, I remember. The, um... Yeah, we used to go around for a cup of tea in between training. And then do you remember you made yourself ill because you trained too hard because you had yeah, no, nothing else to do? Yeah, I was training hard and, you know, I was not close to it anyway. So I just kept training and that was obviously, you know, not good as well. So, yeah, it was but it was an amazing time. And, and, and actually, when I think back to my journey alongside you, it's been such an incredible one. And actually, speaking of me being a younger athlete there and some of the mistakes I would make, what would be the kind of golden piece of advice you give to any young fencer now? Or is there uh, no such thing as a golden piece of advice? I'll give you a little tip, right? If you want to be a okay. professional fencer or professional athlete, learn how to sleep on demand. Learn how to have a nap which is not easy to do. You know, people don't rate naps. I always have a nap. Have a nap in between the rounds, freshen up your brain, learn to sleep on aeroplanes. And there you are. There's a little bit of a, advice. If you can force yourself to sleep and you might not think it is sleep because you won't be completely out. You'll think you'll be awake, but you're not really awake. It's just a sort of uh, limbo state. But if you can recreate that state, then you can really get more out of your brain when you travel or when you compete in competitions. And then the other piece of advice is just train. You have to clock up the the time on the piece you have to get the mileage in so just keep uh, plugging away things that i've learned from you a couple of things is make sure you nap because you're going to need it and i'll become a good nap yeah. i'll be copying you on that one <laughs> yeah oh I've, I've been consistently training alongside you but the second the third one that i think was a big learning one for me is make lunch at the hotel from breakfast that was always one. <laughs> wrap, wrap your sandwiches up and your napkin and take it yeah. for lunch and your money you know, saving I've, tips from richard <laughs> i've only had two problems with doing that in all my time in a hotel because obviously you're paying to stay in the hotel yeah. so they generally don't mind if you steal a few bread rolls from breakfast one time was in cuba and the, the woman said right put it back and then <laughs> and then i went around the other way and she caught me again and really <laughs> she was upset that i'd taken the napkin because it was a sort of fabric kind of oh, napkin yeah. So she said, right, you can take the sandwiches if you leave the napkin. And then <laughs> the other time we were in France and I, you know, I made a little bit, you know, a few bread rolls, nothing much, took them out. And then I got the bill at the end and it said 10 euros breakfast supplement. Oh, no, they busted you. Busted <laughs> they busted you. me, the, the swines. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Well, Richard, look, it's the last two quick fire questions. And I think Chris has got something to say as well. The, the last question I'll, 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 I'll ask. Uh, before the kind of what does the future hold is yeah. what does fencing mean to you in what way in whatever way you want to take the question what does it mean to you it, uh, now you're now you are finishing your competitive career i'm sure you will have some involvement in fencing whether that in some way in the future but what does it really oh, yeah. what does it mean to you well i mean on, on that ground yeah I'm, I'm still going to be involved uh, you know coaching and you know I'm, it's very hard to leave the community after being involved for 27 years. Uh -huh. You know, I've got some friends that did that, uh, that went cold Turkey that completely left and they said it was, uh, it was bizarre. Uh, but what does it mean to me? Well, you know, it started off like it starts off for most people, a little activity to do on, on Saturday afternoon. It's a great sport. I, I mean, it is a brilliant sport fencing. Um, maybe I like it slightly more because I was good at it. I remember John Southfield asked me, he said, how much do you actually like fencing and how much do you like winning? I suppose it's true. If you never won, you'd yeah. never, you probably wouldn't like the, the game. And then it just sort of evolved into, like you to testify to, a way of life. You know, it's just what we did. We didn't question it. We just did it. We, everyone else went to the office, do a 9 to 5.30. We'd turn up at Lee Valley and, you know, get on with the foam rolling, stretching, lessons, footwork. And it just, just what we did. That's so, yeah, it's a way of life, I think. A way of life i like yeah. that and finally what what is kind of now and yvonne you please feel free to speak on this as well this last question what does the future hold for, for 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 you both is there are we maybe staying in london going to cuba what's what is what coaching other jobs other things other passions what does the future hold for you both well at some point we would like to maybe live in cuba um okay because I think it's fair for him to experience it, how is it being mm -hmm. there as the same way I experience here. Sure. But yeah, that would be something that we might decide uh, maybe later on, seeing how things go, um, 
how things evolve. Yeah, give it, give it 20, 30 years, we'll get a B and B, Airbnb, <laughs> Casa Particular in Cuba. You can come and visit us, Ben. I'd love to. We'll I'd do a bit of fishing on the Malecon. That's it. Absolutely. Lie on the beach, enjoy a little, uh, you know, coconut rum or something like that. It sounds great. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Chris, we you... house on the beach. <laughs> yeah, well, that, I always talk to, to to Richard about this, and we always laugh and said, you know, he loves the idea of this, of also the simplicity of 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 living. Sometimes in the, you know, we overcomplicate it in in Europe and in the West. Certainly in London, it's too busy, too stressful, yeah. and actually sometimes having the simple things in life done well, like it is in Cuba, is. is I tell you what, it's like Ben. It's like lockdown, except you're in the tropics. <laughs> it's yeah, like amazing. what we've just been through. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You don't have to exactly. do anything. <laughs> the sea air, you know, the beach is, is beautiful, yeah. and, the, and the wonderful way of life, and the zest for life people have. It's yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, Chris, did you have anything you want to add? Yeah, I've got a couple of quick questions actually. For one that's just come to me, what did you do in the first lockdown? Because in the everybody was forced to stop. I, you know, I know Ben mm. stopped training for four months. I think. Yeah, yeah, every, that's right. What, yeah, what did you do? What like, it's different. Yeah. It what it's been in the last six months yeah we literally stopped for six months uh, for four months because then afterwards we had special dispensation as uh, elite fencers to carry on so we were quite privileged because fencing clubs throughout the uk were on then they were off but you know after that first four months we were back on um yeah the first four months i i mean i tried to stay fit i tried to run we started uh, running in the golf course because the golf course all of a sudden became open to the public which it wasn't before they couldn't play golf and, uh, you know, I did a bit of cycling. I even did a little scam, actually. I borrowed a putter from one of my friends. I'll tell you, it's a true story. <laughs> I, I always wanted to be like one of those posh people playing golf. So I had a little, got a putter, found some golf balls in the rough. And Yvonne and I had a like, nice little hour of pitch and putt on the razor. <laughs> but then someone caught us, right, from the club and came out. And they, he was furious. He was livid. Because I think that's like a real faux pas to sneak onto a golf course and start stealing some uh, enjoyment. <laughs> and then uh so he did a good little scam to spook me he started coughing at me and he said oh i've just had that covid last last <laughs> last, uh, last week i had covid i was vomiting shivering and then he comes up to me puts his hand around me and says right let me help you with that swing and he starts <laughs> amazing <laughs> and then, I, then there's a true story and i said oh no don't worry i had covid as well a few weeks ago and he's gone <laughs> <Disappeared>. <laughs> clever very That's clever amazing. Well, so I, I I suppose kind of just going on from what Ben was just asking, and actually I've got one quick question for maybe both of you at the end, but um, one more quick question is, are you, how do you feel about the next stage? Are you really excited about the next, the next step now that you're taking a step back from fencing? Yeah, I, I think it's time to move on. You know, it's, uh, I'm certainly going to miss it, but it, you know, I'm going to be 38 in the summer and, you know, it's done. It's a chapter that's closed and you know, I've achieved actually a little bit more than uh, what I thought I would achieve. Of course, you always want more. You start to think, oh, what if, you know, the Olympic medal? What if I just want an extra fight here, there? Um, but I think I'm happy with it, happy to close that chapter and, and to move on. But I look back with uh, with happiness. Yeah. yeah. You know, that's why that's what I liked about lockdown. You know, all those little things that you used to not be able to do because you're so busy, you could all of a sudden do. You could play games with the family. We used to play a bit of Uno. Yeah. I remember back in the day when I used to have a beer with my dad, we used to say, oh, let's let's learn that little riff from Desperado, you know, and we'd never do it because we were too busy. And then in lockdown, we started getting the guitars out every night, doing the Desperado. You, you just do stuff that you couldn't usually do. So there was actually something quite pleasant about, um, about lockdown. What do you think, Ben? Did you have a, a good little experience as well? It's been weird, but it was great. You know, Chris and I started the podcast and, and that's why, mm. um, you know, it's been going so well. You know, I built a dummy on the balcony because like really? you, it's a way of life, it's an obsession. Um, I did a little bit of work with the with the scouts, teaching them to fence online. That mm. was great. I got to spend more time with my with my girlfriend and, and her flatmates and, and stuff. So yeah, I, we, it was, I look at it and think did I have a year and potentially a half of my career stolen away from me but actually I think about all of the positive things that I've been able to do and actually you know we did get to go back training relatively soon um, and actually if you ignore all the competitions and everything ultimately we, we do fencing because we love it and so to be able to get back to it was important to me but but ultimately I found time and experiences and things in lockdown that I think were healthy 
and important to to have other things like you said and you know we've mm-hmm. even just brushed over the whole fact that you also play guitar richard so you know that i think learning new skills having that kind of time to not constantly be living life at a thousand miles an hour or you know going from training to having a nap to eating lunch to then going to club you know i think it was important to get a bit more of a balance in life so um yeah it was it was good and 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 i think that now i've come out of it i'm excited for to get back to things but i i must say personally it's a it's a it's not a shame to see you retire because i think as you say you had an amazing chapter of your life and it's been incredible i will obviously miss having you at at training and at competitions Mm -hmm. on the team and stuff but and it and it was a bit emotional i think our last session do you remember when i knew it was my last session we had our last match ever i saluted you off i said that's it that was weird. Overall, know, yeah. From 2006 to our last match in, in 2021. 2021 is, 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 yeah. is scary. And it was emotional. And I, as I say, you'll be sorely missed, but you're not going far, which is great. Um, yeah, we need, we yeah. need to get a, a plaque made. You can put it up at centre. You know, we do. We should <laughs> do. Leon, we... Leon Paul Centre, home of Richard Cruz. For some <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm, in, I'm on the Hall of Fame up there, so I don't mind. Uh, you know, you are. Post reviews, you would go down the stairs, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. yeah you won the test event in uh, the London Test event. I was there for Yeah. That. Yeah, but, you there? I was there. I was in the crowd. Yeah, I was in there. Yeah. I was one of the people that was keen enough to get the limited tickets as soon as they were yeah. announced. <laughs> I, I get the feeling we just tried a little bit harder than the rest of the teams because it was our home event. Mm. Um, but you know, so what? Exactly. Well, I think it's been a, a sparkling career, an amazing career. One that, as I say, coming to the end now is sad but yeah exciting for the next chapter of your life and uh i suppose on behalf of all of british fencing we probably and the community we say you know what a what a pleasure it's been to watch your your career and it's been nice to talk about today things that didn't necessarily involve all the results and actually to get no no yeah. a bit more about you and, and and what the future holds and obviously get to for the for everybody to hopefully meet yvonne as well albeit via the power of the podcast so uh mm-hmm. richard cruz and Yvonne, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much, Ben thank and Chris. Yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure. And obviously, I'm plugging my interview with British Fencing. So wait till the summer. If you want a more sort of hardcore uh, interview about the results and you know every chapter, which we couldn't cover here because we'd just be covering um, ground that's already been explored in that interview. But it's coming out in the summer. And it, it, it is actually a good interview. So um, hopefully that will be as successful as well. A lot of coverage of Richard Cruz and it's, it's nice as, <laughs> as teammates to, to, to reminisce as well. So it's been, a, it's been great fun. Um, and yeah, for Chris and I, guys, thank you so much. Should we, should we end with a joke from Donnie McKenzie? Yeah, go on. Let's, let's, uh, let's have a joke. Right. Donnie McKenzie. Just after Donnie McKenzie retired, he said to me, he said, knock, knock. Who's there? Donnie. Donnie who? That's fencing for you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you will not be forgotten, Mr. Mr. Cruz. But yeah, no, I, yeah. I see what he's getting at there. So, yeah. well, um, I mean, I, I hope the, uh, we, you know, things start to open up for all of us and, and that this won't be the last time and that maybe you and I can get, get a beer with, uh, with Toff next week and, and, you know, we can all maybe... Go Let's go down the snooker club. We're both members of the old hurricane room, aren't we, Ben? Let's go down That's the snooker club. Cool. <laughs> Pack a full your balls are out. Sounds good. So nice one. Sounds <laughs> good. Right. Cheers, guys. Okay, thank you. Hasta luego. Gracias. Thanks. Muchas gracias. The Fenced In podcast has been created in association with J4G Design, your one-stop user experience agency for all things digital, websites, graphic design and technical support.